that's probably not good. It runs, it drives, it kind of stops. Max isn't too impressed. So yeah, we're not gonna be fixing that. Our filler neck and sending unit are stuck in some kind of supply chain purgatory. Well, folks, I forgot a step. You guys never miss anything. And a few people in the comments pointed out that I did not bend these ears over on the outboard brake pad. Sorry guys, I'm not perfect. I didn't actually know you had to do that. So we're gonna fix that real quick. The service manual does show that being done, but they show using a pair of vice grips to clamp this ear over. I tried that on the other side, it didn't work at all. So we're gonna do it this way. Uh, what they want is the ear bent over kind of into the corner so that it holds the pad this way and this way. There we go. Now the bottom side. Beautiful. Yeah, I guess that they could rattle around. They can't possibly come out because the pins go through holes in the, the brake shoe. And then this bottom bent over section engages a notch in the caliper. They can't come out, but they could, you know, have a minor rattle. And if there's one thing that we wouldn't want on a 41 year old truck that was abandoned for 12 years, it's a minor rattle, but no, that's good. You guys keep me on my toes and I appreciate that. All right, folks, let's talk about the vacuum slash emission system. This truck's got a lot of them and they have a lot of problems. So that valve's broken off. Most of the vacuum lines are rotted. Most of the stuff's already been disconnected or, or blocked off. So we need some kind of a game plan. Now, if you watch any of the big YouTube revival channels, you know, your vice grips or your junkyard digs or whatever, they just block off all the ports at the carburetor and effectively delete all the emission systems. And that's, that's fine for their purposes. You know, they just want to get the thing running and maybe drive it to an arbitrary destination and of course make a video about it. We could do that too, but I'm not sure it's a good idea. Uh, the other problem is if we just delete this whole system, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater because there's some stuff here that we, we would like to preserve, mostly the vacuum advance on the distributor and this vacuum switch for the torque converter lock. So the vacuum advance is gonna give us more power, better fuel mileage, and the torque converter lock, obviously, it's gonna improve fuel mileage at cruising speed. So really this truck's in kind of a sweet spot as far as emissions goes, uh, probably because it's a truck. So the emissions regulations are a little more lax and I guess because of the age, but it doesn't have, you know, a feedback carburetor or a smog pump or anything, anything really obnoxious. Really the emission systems are the same as a modern car. They're just, they're just controlled differently. So on a, norm, on a modern car, you know, the timing and EGR valve and purge flow and all that stuff would be controlled by the computer electronically. On this truck, everything's controlled using thermal switches and actuated using vacuum. Are you supposed to be eating a customer's truck? Somehow I don't think that's an approved behavior, pup. Is there a rodent in the rocker panel? You haven't killed enough mice lately? All right, well, you sort it out, buddy. 
Well, I guess. Might as well get into this carburetor. I'll be honest with you guys, I don't know that much about automotive carburetors. I do okay with the small engine stuff and like slide carburetors off motorcycles and I'm fine with the, the updraft old school stuff on tractors, but I just don't know that much about these automotive carbs. Anyway, I've got a rebuild kit here. It should have all the pieces and parts that we need, hopefully. This is a Rochester Quadrajet. No idea what model. Well, I actually don't know how this thing ran. You can't tell from the outside, but it's clear full of residue from a fire extinguisher. The only reason that didn't go through the engine is that the, uh, the secondary throttle shaft is seized. So, yeah, that's fun. Let me figure out how we can get that apart. Some nice stuff. Real nice stuff. Now, a viewer sent me this ultrasonic cleaner. This is the first time I've actually used it. It's a DK600, which is a six liter capacity. And Mortsky said to run pine saw in it. So that's what I did. Shop smells like a Christmas tree farm. Uh, it works. It's not perfect, but it works. A couple observations. The heat, the heat part of it seems to be just as important as the ultrasonic part. So I had to let it warm up for quite a while, like over an hour before it really started kind of working. And then I put uh, the parts in it for an hour, a little over an hour with the ultrasonic function on. It's not quite big enough for a four barrel carburetor. You can do it, but you can't you can't quite get the whole thing in there. So I ended up doing it in two batches. There's three kind of big pieces. Uh, it did okay, but there are some spots that it, that it struggled with. So it doesn't seem to do much with this kind of scaly stuff that's built up in the bottom of the bowl. So I'm gonna have to scrape that out. I did scrape all the big chunks off before I put it in the cleaner. And then, you know, there's things like build up here on the shafts on the choke plates here. So I think what I'm going to do, I'll go through and I'll scrape the stuff again and then I'll run it through the regular solvent parts washer tank and see if it'll clean up some of this kind of oily stuff. And then I think we'll be in good shape. It worked really good on the smalls, the screws and jets and the hardware and stuff. I think that's about as clean as we're going to get it. I think I got kind of the main working part of the carburetor assembled. So underneath of this screw here, 
there's a ball that's like a check valve for the accelerator pump. You have to transfer the spring and this retainer from the old accelerator pump to the new accelerator pump. So, and there's a spring at the bottom too. So that fits down in that bore. And then when you really romp on it, it's like a little pump in here that pumps a shot of fuel right into the intake. It makes up for that kind of instantaneous need for fuel. Then on the power piston, I believe that's what they call it, this guy here, that's going to be like vacuum controlled. And these little rods go down into the main, the main jets. And I screwed up. I took the stop out. So behind here, this guy with a little flat head, that's the stop for the power piston. And it has a spring underneath of it. It has to be adjusted. And I found a, a good write-up online on how to do that. I use some calipers, but I think you could do it just by kind of dead reckoning. And then there is an adjustment for the float. It has to be 13, 30 seconds below the top level of the, the bowl here. That was right on. So yeah, we should be all set. I gotta put this plastic giz gizmo in here and then install the gasket. And we should be able to put this thing back together. Well, it looks like a carburetor. And that's all that really matters. There are some more parts here for the choke, the electric choke, which is this guy here. It looks pretty complicated. You gotta drill out rivets and there's a whole bunch of adjustments you have to make. I say we put it back on the truck and we'll see how it does. If it has problems, we can adjust it or you know tinker with it while it's while it's mounted. If it works fine, then then we don't have to worry about it. Oh boy. So that goes like so. I'm assuming there's no top and bottom. But I don't really know. Yeah, the throttle shaft's got a little bit of slop, like every carburetor. I don't think it's bad enough to need bushings. All right, we got a new distributor cap. We have to transfer over the coil. Come on, little buddy. There it is. Our new carbon button. later that goes like so That's going to look kind of dumb. Blue cap with a black cover.
I've already installed my new rotor. And I've got these little legs pre-staged. So I should be able to just drop this on there. Should be able to just drop this on there. That's the problem here. There it is. Now, quarter turn, quarter turn. There we go. Now, that one and that one, I guess. Is that the only two? Looks that way. Cool. Well, it must have been a long trip for these spark plugs all the way from USA. I think they're gapped a little tighter than they should be. So let me fix that, we'll get them installed. I think it goes like that. Something like that. folks it does exist it got stuck on the slow boat from Kansas but it's finally here we've got our sending unit three line looks good our two filler neck hoses those look pretty good uh, but this is the best part they sell this as an anti-squeak kit, like an isolator kit for the fuel tank straps. They charge 10 bucks for this. You know what it is? It's just felt paper, like you put underneath the shingles. It even has the, the chalk line on it. I mean, you gotta be kidding me. Like you would think, maybe they would put in the description, hey, it's just some cheap felt paper, 25 cents worth of material. I don't know, I could have sold you an ice and water shield. At least that has some thickness to it. Still only 25 cents worth of material. I don't know, buyer beware, I guess. Better do some trimming. Okay. 
Is that right, or does it go on the top one? This one's way long, the other one's way too short. I wonder if they're different lengths. Well, sure enough, got bit by the 50-50-90 rule. It's what I get for working past eight o'clock, I guess. that'll work. I think we'll leave them loose until we get the thing kind of situated in case we have to move the hangers back and forth to get the holes to line up. folks I think we're ready got the filler neck installed sending unit with the short jumper hoses and the straps that should be all we need my big concern is getting these jumper hoses attached to the hard lines you're probably supposed to remove the box to do this because the only access is right here between the frame rail and the bottom of the box or the back of the cab whatever that is anyway it's gonna be tricky. Well, we got a slight problem. It fits good, looks good. However, the sending unit on the 20 gallon tank is quite a bit further back than on the 16 gallon tank. Don't ask me why. So I guess what we're gonna have to do is pull it back down and I'll make some longer hoses and we'll just kinda have to make an S shape. Well, this is the best I could come up with. I, I can't do an S bend, it's just too tight. This is where the lines come out. So we're gonna do a, a coil around the sending unit just kind of come in like this. It may actually be a, a blessing in disguise because now I've got plenty of slack to hook these hoses up before the tank's fully installed. Well, that was certainly a lot easier to attach. As long as there's room on top of the tank for that to coil up, I think we should be, we should be all set. The tank is in. I think it looks pretty good. I did have to dodge a cross member. I think it's that one right there with my hoses, but there was plenty of slack. I could just kind of scoot them out of the way. Attach the ground. I think we're all set. I'm just sucking the old gas out of the other fuel tank and then we're gonna cap it off. All right, now this rat's nest. So this gizmo here is the selector valve that lets you switch from the left tank to the right tank. We're going to eliminate that. I don't know if it has anything to do with the sending unit or if that's a separate system, you know, as far as the fuel level goes. That's the EVAP line. Okay, there we go. 
I was gonna blow the lines out, but they look perfect inside. Which is amazing since they've been, some of them have been open. Uh-oh. Did we spring a leak? Kind of looks that way. Well, crap. Thought those hard lines were good. spot on the back where it's been nicked or something, I don't know. Well, that's not the right way to fix it. I mean, technically we should make a new, a whole new hard line. But since the tube's not actually broken, just has a small spot that's rubbed through on the back side, I think we'll get away with it. Well, I'm reasonably happy with that. Let's finish it up and we'll test drive it and see, just see how it works. If it leaks, you know, obviously we'll revisit it. All right, guys, we're getting pretty close. I drained the oil, put on a new oil filter and I replaced the mechanical fuel pump along with these two hoses here. I did not record that. It's, it's impossible. You need four hands and a lot of naughty words to get one of those installed. Uh, the process is, you know, pretty straightforward. You just, there's a bolt up here. Maybe you can see it's got some RTV silicone on it. Take that bolt out. Then you can push the push rod back up towards the cam and then stick something in that hole. I just use a small screwdriver to hold the push rod while you install the fuel pump from the side. But the reality is, is not that simple. You got to hold bolts and gaskets and the push rod and then get everything lined up. And that's a Carter fuel pump. You know, it's a name brand fuel pump, but it didn't fit right. The lever sticks out a little further. So I had to fight against the spring tension. And then this fitting here is clocked differently. So I had to bend the hard line up to the carburetor to get it to, to thread in there. This fitting is also clocked differently. So I don't know what, what the deal is. I mean, how many million small block Chevys did they make and they can't figure out how to make a pump for it? Well, everybody knows you can't use a modern oil in one of these old engines. You just blow it up right away. So we're going to use some of this vintage Valvoline circa 2006. Somebody gave it to me, brand new, sealed in a, in a container. Uh, but honestly, what do you guys think about this whole zinc additive kerfuffle? The prevailing wisdom on the internet is that all these old engines with flat tappet cams, which I believe this has a flat tappet cam, that they all require some kind of additional zinc additive or else you're going to wipe out the camshaft. I think it's a bunch of crap personally. Like the idea that oil was better 40 years ago than what it is now. That's hilarious. I mean, obviously camshafts failed with some frequency, even when oil had more zinc added additives in it. So it's not like it was a hundred percent cure all.
So here's my argument against the zinc additives. You guys tell me what you think. I know it's a, it's a hornet's nest. Every farmer that I know has some kind of an old tractor or engine or something with a flat tappet camshaft and they all run the cheapest, crappiest oil you can think of. And you never hear about camshafts failing on tractors or industrial engines. A lot of people say you can run diesel oil, 1540. It has a higher zinc content. Some of it does, some of it doesn't. So you just gotta, you gotta do your research. I think Shell Rotella T4 has a higher zinc content and the Mag1 oil that I use has a higher zinc content. It's like 1200 parts per million. But a lot of the diesel oils now follow the same specs as regular gas engine oils and they're like 800. And apparently, according to the internet, that's not enough. So I don't know. So here'd be my advice. If you have a high lift camshaft or some stronger valve springs or something for a, you know, a performance application, buy a performance application oil, you know, buy an AMS oil or whatever that's designed with the higher zinc content. Don't add a zinc additive to some generic oil because you don't know how that zinc additive is going to interact with the other additives that are already in that oil. Maybe, maybe Project Farm or somebody has a, a video that addresses that. I don't know. Okay, let's add a little go-go juice right into the bowl. That should be. That should get us started. Well, for now, I just went ahead and plugged off all the vacuum ports. It should run. I mean, it's got everything it needs. Let's see what happens. I think we've got to raise the idle speed a little bit. I mean, it did run for almost five minutes. Still some work to do, I think. Well, we might as well do what we should have done from the start. All right, some thick stuff. You wouldn't think it would rust out. Uh, 
don't know if there's gonna be room for this or not. Doesn't appear so. Well, that might have worked. steel to five sixteenths straight that's that guy three eight steel to three eighths nylon straight that's that guy okay and then we're gonna need this and that and one of these kind of weird because the plastic 3 8 line is 3 8 outside diameter and the rubber 3 8 fuel line is 3 8 inside diameter so I thought the barb would fit better inside that rubber hose that's okay see that quarter inch fits a lot better yeah that's how it should fit There we go. This 5 16 line for the EVAP. So this 5 16 line for the charcoal canister, we'll just run some more rubber hose. And I just made a little barb out of some 5 16 NICOP. And I used the first stage of the inverted flare to put a little, little barb shape on the end. I mean, there's no pressure there, so it should be fine. All right, folks, I think think we're finally done on the bottom side of this truck I know hindsight's 2020 but we should have just replaced all the brake lines and all the fuel lines from the get-go at least the ones in the bottom kind of the bottom third of the truck anyway I'm pretty happy with our repair the lines from this point forward look fine but 
I mean, that's only about three feet of line, so we didn't save ourselves a whole lot. If you didn't follow what I was doing, I just formed a quick disconnect end on the steel line, and then I could clip on this plastic or nylon fuel line. It's probably overkill for this, this application. There's no pressure, but that's my preferred method. And then I just use the hose for the EVAP line because, because who cares? Oh, there's a zip tie I forgot to trim. Two of them. Getting sloppy was. I'm pretty happy with that. I think it'll do the trick. I also installed a new muffler. Look at that fancy thing. The old one was pretty much rotted out. But the rest of the exhaust system was really in pretty good shape, other than the, uh, the clamps, which I replaced one, two, three, four, five of those. Yeah, I know the catalytic converter is a potential issue. I don't think it's plugged up now, but once they start driving it and bouncing it down the road, I mean, you know what's gonna happen. Uh, apparently these have pellets inside. They had to be replaced periodically. I don't know that much about them. All I know is that I, I can't touch it legally. I could get in big trouble. But you know, if something were to happen to it after it left my shop, I doubt anybody's gonna find out. Anyway, yeah, fuel tank looks good. The old fuel tank, I sucked every drop of fuel out of that thing that I possibly could. I think there was like almost 10 gallons of fuel in it and it's still dripping. It has not stopped dripping since it's been in my shop. All right, set the choke. The thermal part of the choke seems to work. I mean, it opens the blades, but something's wrong with the, the high idle part of it. So once we figure out the vacuum system, we'll have to adjust that. Look at that folks, a brand new thermal vacuum switch. Try explaining that to the parts guy. Good luck. Amazingly, someone still makes it. smart we'd probably drain the coolant but uh, let's make sure there's no pressure on it how about that I think I can just kind of pinch off this upper radiator hose and then do the old hot swap Well, now we just start putting puzzle pieces together following the diagram. So this top one here, it's gonna go to this check valve. Like so. And then it should go to a T to the 
heat riser in the air cleaner, but I think we're going to eliminate that. So instead, I'm going to run it right to the manifold vacuum port. There we go. Now, what's next? I picked up one of these vacuum cap assortments because there are a couple we're gonna cap off. Starting with this one. That is for the, the EFE, which I believe is a, a butterfly in the exhaust. We're not gonna use that one either. So I'm gonna revive everything except for the heat riser and that exhaust butterfly. Look at that 80s emission sweetness. Like I said, I think I said, there's two systems we're not gonna revive. There's a T here that would provide vacuum to the thermal switch in the air cleaner housing. That opens the door for the heat riser. That switch is all melted. I'm assuming from the same incident that gave us the fire extinguisher residue in the carburetor. And then the other one is this EFE, which I thought was to do with the emission system, or sorry, the evaporative system. But I believe it's actually that butterfly in the exhaust pipe. That thing looks pretty scary. We don't want that to get stuck closed. I think the purpose of those two items is to get the engine to warm up more quickly. It might be just to get the intake manifold to warm up. Uh, either way, it'll run fine without those. You know, possibly a little harder on the polar bears, but not a big deal. And we'll throw that crusty old spaghetti in the garbage. That's about it, guys. We've got to mess with the high idle. There's a screw right there underneath the choke. And then there's a bunch of cams and stuff to do with that. Not a hundred percent sure how to, how to adjust or set that, but we've got to fix it because it doesn't work. It doesn't seem to work at all. Other than that, I think we're about done. should move down as the choke warms up. So now the cam's all the way down. Almost all the way down. It should be off my idle now. I ordered a new air filter, but she doesn't quite measure up. At this point, what's another day? Oh, there's that melted switch, by the way. And there's the vacuum line. So this little guy here opens up the flap for the heat riser. But I don't think anybody's going to miss that. All right, folks, I'm gonna go for a drive last night, but she's got no tail lights or brake lights. Headlights work, except for one of the high beams. But it's still, still not running quite right. So let's see how it does on a cold start. It's just above snowing right now. So we'll give her one pump. Yeah, our high idle's still not working quite right. Well, maybe it is. Nah, it just doesn't stay high. So I gotta check that. And then, the other problem I was having is you put it in gear and it just barely stays running. And then you go to tip into the throttle and it kind of falls on its face. So we gotta check the timing. I don't know where it's at. Uh, what else? The fuel gauge doesn't seem to work. 
so that's fun. <sighs> Typical stuff. The brakes work though, so that's good. See, there it is, right there. The idle just kind of hangs. That's pretty much what it does. Let's get it inside. Let's see what we can do about that. It starts good though. <laughs> well, I refuse to push a running truck into the shop, so it's going to go one way or the other. Let's get on some flat ground here. Ugh, I can't even do that. There we go. Must have found its happy place. Alright, well, let's get into it. I think it actually runs worse now that we clean the carburetor. Which means we probably put it back together wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. Well, I doubt that's gonna show up, but the timing was pretty close. It was about two degrees. It's supposed to be four degrees. Well, I don't know. The timing was set at about two degrees and I adjusted it to four degrees. And I tweaked the idle speed just a, just a hair and it seems to, to run and do fine now. Well, this might be the easiest wiring repair you've ever seen on this channel. So it's got a, a T in the harness for the tail lights to add a four pin trailer connector and it just came unplugged on one side so let's plug that back in see if it solves our problems that'd be pretty sweet if it did well look at that yeah i wonder where max is probably chasing bunnies Okay, so we're on the fast idle now. Might be a little high. Now it's happy. That's weird. Could two degrees of timing really make that much difference? I'll tell you what, she cruises right down the road. I think the speedometer is wrong though. 
There's no way we're going 60. Transmission shift's good. I like it. I'll tell you what, this thing's running like a million bucks. Can't even hear the engine over the speedometer cable. Are you trying to tell me that my shop is a mess? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Pretty much. A messy shop is a busy shop, lady. That is true. Alright. You true. want to drive this thing? I've already driven it. Well, this time it actually runs. Do you have keys? Should be in it. Oh, okay. Okay, now you gotta let it warm up for a minute. Like a diesel? Before it comes off high idle. What's going on with this thing? Tap it again. I don't know. Well, you took too long that I grew a kiddo. Yeah, bottle shaft stuck, I guess, for some reason. This is a great conclusion to your video. That's why you couldn't pay me to drive a carburetor vehicle. Yeah. What do you think, ready to trade your heated seats for a 81 C10? Well, considering backing up, it oh. couldn't make it up this slight yeah. incline. She's a one wheel peel. But, sure. but, 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 I don't know what to do. Uh, did you see my rear view mirror and how helpful he was? <laughs> I don't know what to do. That's your parking assistant. Remember, like, three, remember three days ago when the parking lot was empty? Uh huh. Those were good days. Yep. When, when Dad had no cars. No cars. All right. Say goodbye. Adios. Bye. bye. <sighs> well, folks, we do it right because we do it twice. Wouldn't be a proper carburetor rebuild unless we did it at least twice. My theory was that there was something plugging up one of these low-speed passages. And I think that would explain the stumble off of idle but it certainly doesn't explain why it got stuck on high idle and why the idle speed just isn't repeatable. So talking to Mortsky last night, you know, it just kind of, it kind of seems like the only explanation is the play in the throttle shaft. So it's quite a bit. I guess we could measure it, but it's probably 20 to 30 thousandths. It looks like it's around 20 thousandths depending on how you, how you wiggle it. But that's way too much. I guess the primary you know, problem would be the vacuum leaks around the throttle shaft. But it seems like it's just getting, getting itself kind of wedged against the high idle cam and that's why it's not repeatable. Or maybe it's getting wedged against the idle stop. I don't know, something's, something's not right. Anyway, it's pretty simple to fix this problem. 
I've never done it before. I followed some instructions I found online. You got to remove all the springs and linkages and stuff. And then you got to grind the ends off the screws that hold the actual butterflies. Back those screws out, pull out the throttle shaft. And then we're going to install a bushing, a bronze bushing here in the end. It's a 5 16 inside diameter, 3 8 outside diameter. And you use a reamer turned around backwards, stick it through here, and the shank acts as a pilot, kind of like a kingpin reamer. And the reason that this works is that the actual bearing support surface in the original carburetor only comes out to about here. So this outside portion here is just kind of a dummy, a dummy bore that's oversized. And we're going to take advantage of that. So I've already reamed these out. We're going to put some Loctite on these bushings. Except that's the wrong kind of Loctite. Let's try this stuff. High strength. Honestly, like super glue or a two-part epoxy would probably work just as well. I'm using off the shelf oil light bushings, so it's a little bit more involved, I imagine, than if you bought one of the, the kits that's made just for this purpose, but you can find them at Summit Racing or, or wherever. Anyway, these oil light bushings that I use, they're like one thousandth oversize on the outside diameter, and you have to typically have to size them once they're pressed in because the inside collapses. So I just ran a 5 16 reamer down through the inside to open it back up. And now, we've got a nice tight fit. Still moves freely, but there's no, there's no slop in that to speak of. I am gonna drill and tap these holes for the butterflies. I think the original thread was a 348, like a number three, and 48 threads per inch. I'm gonna tap them out to 440. I've got tons of 440 screws. That'll be better anyway. The other advantage of installing those bushings outside of the original bearing area is that we get away from any wear that's on the shaft. This one isn't isn't too bad, but it does have, does have some. Now the fun part. I'm gonna figure out how to put this thing back together. It's kind of like assembling a Swiss watch, except it was mass produced in America. Seems right. We probably ought to put some Loctite on that. That's it. Looks pretty decent, I think. That one's still turned just a little bit, but it seals up nice. We're gonna let it go. Should we stake those over like the other ones? 
I mean, it would be a pretty bad day if one of those screws came out and went down inside the engine. Well, cross your fingers, folks. I hope this works. There was a time, long ago, a utopia really, where engines did not need fancy computers and sensors and solenoids. They used simple, reliable mechanical systems. Those systems rarely needed repair or adjustment, but when they did, they could be made by ordinary people using simple tools. Except, apparently, for this ordinary person who's been struggling. I probably honestly have at least six, maybe eight hours into this carburetor. And as far as I can tell, it's no better now than when we drug it off the trailer. It might actually be worse. So just to review, it runs, it starts, it runs fine above idle, but it just will not idle consistently. And sometimes the idle gets stuck high. We've tried adjusting the high idle. Then it had the problem where it would fall on its face on tip in, thought we had a vacuum leak. We tried rebushing the throttle shaft we checked the base gasket. I replaced everything that could possibly leak a vacuum. What else? I finally knocked out the steel plugs on the bottom and adjusted the low speed mixture. That helped a bit, but it still just isn't consistent and it just didn't make any sense. And I finally found the problem. You know, when I started this process, I actually priced out a reman carburetor. You can buy a whole rebuilt unit that's tested and ready to go. But they're very expensive, like $400 and $450 for one of these. And I just couldn't see spending that kind of money on a simple carburetor, but now I get it. The problem, and I think maybe the problem all along, is actually with the choke, not the carburetor. At least not entirely with the carburetor. This is a very complicated system. It's the most complicated part of the carburetor, in my opinion. This thing would make Rube Goldberg proud. So this model has an electric thermostatic choke. I'll try to explain to you guys how this works. Behind this plastic cover, there's a bimetallic clock spring. And when it's cold, which it is now, it's trying to, to pull these levers back up to the top. This is the cold start configuration. This is how the carburetor should look on a cold start. These levers are right now being held down because the throttle is fully closed. So it's trying to shove the fast idle cam underneath the fast idle adjuster down here, but it can't do it because the, the throttle is closed. So on cold start, we're gonna pump the accelerator one time. That's going to close the choke like so. It's gonna pump the accelerator pump one time to squirt some fuel into the bore. And it lets these cams come up to the top, these levers come up to the top. That sets us on our fast idle. 
So right now the throttle is actually being held open slightly by this high idle cam. As soon as the engine starts, it starts to make vacuum. It pulls in this little vacuum pot back here. That's your choke pull off and it opens the choke slightly. It won't keep running if the choke's fully closed. So as soon as it starts, it opens the choke just a little bit. It also now has 12 volt power coming into the electric choke. There's a heating element here. That heating element starts to heat up the bimetallic spring inside here. And it's gonna slowly release its tension on these levers. Now the levers aren't gonna move because Again, they have tension from the throttle. But every time that you tap the throttle, these levers can come down as far as the bimetallic spring will allow. Should take a couple minutes for the bimetallic spring to fully open up. And at that point, tap the throttle, and now your choke is fully off, and your fast idle is fully off. So now you're back down to your base idle. That's the way it's supposed to work. On a hot start, let's say the engine's cooled off slightly but not 100%, the bimetallic spring in here is still gonna be opened up somewhat because it, it gets heat from the whole engine, not just from the heating element here. So that's kind of important. That's why they don't just use a timer. They have to use the, the bimetallic spring. So you let the engine sit long enough, it cools off, you tap the throttle, and you're back to where you started. There's the clock spring. Let's go to the bench and I'll show you the problem. All right, we're gonna hook up power to the heating element. And there's your problem. Zero amps. So the heating element part of this choke has an open circuit. And I don't know if it's been like that the whole time or if that just happened while it was here. I really don't know. The problem is the, the choke will still work correctly as long as you give it a very long time to warm up. If the engine gets fully warmed up, the bimetallic spring will open just from the heat of the engine. Let me try to demonstrate that. I think what's going on here is the uh, that power piston adjustment is too low so it's a little bit too lean I believe that has to do with part throttle based on what I was reading they call it an APT the idles good and it runs fine you know once it gets past the tip in but it just stumbles right there and you get past that and it's okay so let's uh let's richen that thing up a little bit and see what happens all right i went ahead and pulled the top of the carburetor off and i knocked out the aluminum plug over top of that apt adjuster and then i can use a large schrader valve tool to reach down in there and tweak that thing around once we get it set where we want we'll put the aluminum plug back in I gave it one turn already, let's see what happens. It's better. Yeah, there it is, it's still kinda. All right, let's give it a little more. That's a lot better. I'm pretty happy with that. Runs good. I adjusted the low speed, the idle mixture here. 
on either side. So it was just rich of best vacuum, if that makes sense. So I leaned them out until the vacuum just started to go down, backed them off just a hair. Uh, the vacuum leak that I thought I had, it was this rubber hose to this hard line. I believe that's to the transmission. So we'll fix that too while we're here. That's not bad. There's about a zillion different choke options for these quadrajets. I have no idea what the difference is between them all. Anyway, according to the Standard Motor Products catalog, the correct choke for our carburetor part number is inside this ridiculously large box. It's a CV383. And there it is. So I don't know how we're going to adjust this. The instructions aren't very clear, but we've got to hook the little bimetallic spring inside that lever. Inside that lever, like so. And then I think we're going to just put it back to where, kind of where the old one was. Howdy folks. Is this right? Well, the sun is shining. It's 50 degrees out. Well, that part's right. I mean the carburetor. You're also a millennial, so you're equally unable to understand it. I would like to argue that we are not millennials, even though I would lose that argument. All right, guys, I think I got it finally figured out. So the choke, this electric choke, from my understanding, it's not adjustable. You're supposed to put it, line up the little notch with the little tab on the ear, and that's where it goes. Uh, as far as the carburetor, I've adjusted that APT stop as much as I think I, I, I can. It doesn't seem to get any better. I put the plug back in. I drilled and tapped a blind hole in that so I can pull the plug back out if I need to. I think we're going to put it back together and, uh, and send it home. It still, it still just has a little bit of a stumble off idle under a load when it's cold. Once the engine fully warms up, it seems to be okay. So I don't know, if you guys have ideas how to fix that, type them out in the comments. This truck will still be here, I think, after this video gets posted, so I'll have a little time to tweak it if I get some good ideas. But I think it's, I think it's good enough. We got a new air filter, we're going to throw that on, and uh, I'll get my, my test pilot here to to fire it up for us. Every time you ask me to start this truck, it never works. It's only been one time. But yes, you are correct. That time, it didn't work. Well, wing nut down. Maxwell, what are you doing out there, pup? All right, lady. Give it one solid pump to the floor, then let off, and it should start. Just let it go. All right, one more pump. Okay. This is what it does. Pump the gas a couple times. A couple times. Okay, now start it. I just don't get it. All right, hold the foot. Hold your foot all the way to the floor. Now start it. Nope, don't touch it. Yeah, that's what it does. It's a little bit too much choke. I guess. I don't know. I don't know, guys. I went through every one of these choke setup procedures. You have to set them with a protractor. It's a real pain in the ass. And everything was good. I don't know. It still just doesn't start right. Yeah, there it is. So that part seems to be working. It just, it still won't quite start right. I quit, shut it down. 
It's as good as I can do. I mean, it's workable, but it just seems like it should be better than what it is. I mean, it should start right up and it, it just won't. So you guys tell me what I missed in the comment box. I know everybody on YouTube is a carburetor expert. I'm not. This is a little bit, a little bit beyond me, I guess. It's been a lot of work. Uh, just for reference, I think it's like an eight to one ratio. So for every one hour of video that you guys see, that's about eight hours of work here in the real world. So we're probably gonna have around two and a half hours worth of video on this truck. That's well over 20 hours of work that I've, I've put into it. And if I'm being honest, it's more than that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks guys for watching. We'll see you next time. What's a teaser? <laughs> what did you go pick up with dad last weekend? Hey, I don't think it works as a teaser if you uh, tell people it's a teaser. Just say goodbye. Goodbye. Say coming soon. Coming soon. <laughs> Thanks for watching everybody. All right, here we go. You ready? Hey, I'm over here, dog. Yeah. He's, he's not going to change at this point. I mean, let's be honest.